when we're talking about Anthony Joshua, that was, I think, one of the, the topics I was very keen to bring up with you uh, in this conversation. The, yes. the, the take from Eddie Hearn is that the, the likely opponents for Anthony Joshua are the main Stavern, Kubrat Pulev, and maybe Johan de Paar, Eric Molina, but more likely the main Stavern, Kubrat Pulev. So I'm keen to get your take on, uh, yeah, on those I, guys. Yeah, uh, I read that the other day. Uh, Online there, and I thought it was, uh, you know, I'm I'm impressed that, that Eddie Hearn uh, is actually going to put him in there against somebody decent, which uh, seems to, you know, is not the rule of the day right now. Yeah, and uh, that's exactly what they need to do, I think, because I think they they know what they have in Joshua. They think that he's uh, at least a top three talent, right? Uh, that they believe he's the number one, yeah. And I, I believe he's right there too. I mean, uh, I think he, you know he needs to continue gaining experience. But I like what I see. I like the way he uh, slashes in with his punches, and st- but stays at range, but sort of slashes in quick, gets out. I like the way he puts together his combinations. He seems to uh, he seems to just have a good, steady way about him, and doesn't get to, hasn't made too many big mistakes in there that might cost him. Hmm. I really think uh, Stavern would be a, a really good test. Stavern might even have a good chance of winning that fight uh, if he can capitalize on uh, Joshua's inexperience. Yeah, a peak Stavern would be a real tough fight for Joshua. I, I just wonder if after the beating he took against Deontay Wilder, you know, he's, he's had one comeback fight where he was dropped by uh, Derek Rossi badly and... Um, he, he's getting older now, Stefan. I think he's thirty-seven or so, and you just wonder what he's got left. Could he be a Could he be a fighter that Deontay Wilder's beaten the best out of? Uh, I think that's pretty likely. I've heard he's had trouble staying in shape now ever since then. Hmm. Who do you think's the tougher fight, Stefan or Pulev? You know what? At this point, it might be uh, Pulev. Hmm. I, I I really uh, rate him sort of because I think. Uh, you know, he sort of clinches and just hangs in there, but he really he really makes sure that you're taking his best punch once every round or two. Like he he really throws a cracking right hand. He doesn't have the biggest power in the world, but he's uh he's crafty and he's you know, make sure that he, he lands. I kind of view him as like a poor man's Vladimir Klitschko. But he's not got the size of Klitschko, he's not got the power of Vladimir Klitschko, but he's got the same jab, you know, that everything comes yeah, off the jab. Yeah. Um, but he presses. He'll he'll press the action a lot more than Klitschko. Like he makes sure he's going to get his work off. Whereas Klitschko is happy to just uh, land a few jabs, and if he's got you out pointed, then he'll just stay to the outside and clinch. Yeah, but I mean, Pulev's in there trying to hurt his man. Where Klitschko maybe is not really emphasizing as much on trying to hurt his man. Yeah, I, I think they're both good fights. I mean, what we've seen with Joshua is in Joshua's last fight. Four fights, he's fought four completely undefeated opponents. He's fought Gary Cornish, Dillian White, Charles Martin and Dominic Brazil. All big guys, all big um, KO ratios, all undefeated. And I think the problem when you're fighting undefeated fighters, especially guys who are fellow prospects, is you don't really know how good they are. So in many ways, like it's really hard to ascertain what level of opponent Joshua has actually beaten in his career today. Guys like Stiverne, guys like Pulev, even to a lesser extent, guys like Molina and Depart, we kind of know where they're they're at a bit more. And I think if Joshua yeah, exactly. goes out, they're a proven yeah. commodity. We know what they're uh, what they're going to bring, and you know, if it, it, that's always the case with these prospect type uh, fighters as they're on their way up. You know, you're always waiting for them to run into that wall of where the guy just has a little bit too much class that they can't handle. Mm. But I'm not sure there is going to be that wall with Joshua. I think he's a championship caliber. And if they can continue improving, I think a lot of those guys can be in trouble at the top. Yeah, well, when you look at him from across the pond, what, what sort of weaknesses do you see in him? What, what sort of ways to get him beat do you think exist? You know what I think is his biggest weakness is that he's a little bit stiff sometimes. Mm. He sort of stands up straight and his, uh, he doesn't move his head much. I mean, I guess he's quite bulky, so you can't expect him to be too agile, but uh, that, that's what I think could be his biggest uh, weakness, that somebody with a punch could, uh, you know, have 
plenty of opportunity to land. Yeah. He's not careful. There's somebody that's quick and crafty and has a good punch. I think Pulev might give him a lot of trouble right now. Pulev would be a massive step up, and my particular opinion is that we won't see the Pulev fight, because I think his handlers have handled him very carefully today, and I think they're more likely to put him in with Stavern, someone who's taken a few more beatings, is a bit further on in his career, is a bit slower, is a bit smaller. I yeah, think the he doesn't fight, punch very long, long either, he's very... Uh... You know, he's compact with his hooks and stuff like that. So a guy like Joshua will have a noticeable uh, size advantage, whereas Pulev still uh, throws those long, straight rights. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. Do you know what? It's funny we were talking about Deontay Wilder's chin earlier. The same sort of concerns over here with Joshua's chin. Uh, you know, he, he was dropped in the amateurs by uh, Dillian White. There's a lot of rumours that Joshua was knocked unconscious in sparring by David Price a few years back. Uh, you know, there's, there's some uncomfortableness about Joshua's chin. But for me, another concern about Joshua is actually stamina, um, especially given his build and how big he is. You know, we, we haven't seen him really had to go to the championship rounds yet. And the way he fights, I, I wonder if that's a problem. Uh, do you have a take on that? Yeah, that's right. Usually the guys that are too muscle-bound, uh, as they found out in the 80s and 90s, tend to gas pretty early in fights. Mm. And uh, it looks almost like he's, uh, you know, maybe backed off uh, the bulking a little bit. In the last fight, he looked. He, how about he, I thought he looked a little more athletic in the ring. Okay. Uh, compared to... Uh, I also noticed uh, Joseph Parker, it appeared... Uh, uh, in that Takam fight, he leaned down quite, quite a bit. Looked like he was bulking up for a while, and then, uh, you know, maybe they realized they need to uh, work more on endurance and stuff like that. Now that they're getting to the top level, instead of bombing the guy out in the first round. Yeah, absolutely. Muscles, muscles don't win fights, and on occasions they uh, they can be quite negative to uh, to have if you you go into. Yeah, a that's right. Because you got to pump oxygen to them, you know. So uh, the bigger you are, the harder it's going to be to, to still have gas left in the 12th round. That's it. That's it. And if I look at Joshua, if I look at the way he fights, you know, very explosive, very athletic, lots of power punches. Um, you know, and if I look at his build and his stiffness, and you know, I, I do question, I do question whether that 12 rounds are going to be a problem. And it's going to be even more of a problem when someone puts it on him, like... Joshua has probably taken two or three punches of note in his entire career, and the majority of those came from the Dillian White fight. And you know, there was a massive haymaker he took to the chin that would have hurt anyone. But what disturbed me even more was the punch he took to the body, and he looked at that really, really, he really, really didn't like that. And I think that's something to watch out for for his future opponents. Yeah, well, he did. Uh, he did appear to gas in that fight, actually. I, I, I watched that fight live, and I watched it a couple times since. Good fight, but uh, yeah, he looked really. He looked like he tried to, you know, get his man out of there. White, it didn't. He didn't get him, and then he was totally gassed, and it took him like almost a round to recover, if I remember. Mm. But I think he's uh, learned his lesson there, and that's exactly why you didn't see him forcing the issue too much against somebody like Brazil last time out. Because, uh, you know, you, you can push and try to get him out of there right away and maybe put on the big show and get him out of there in the first or second round. Because we all saw that Brazil didn't have much to throw back. Yeah. He decided to just stay patient, outbox him, and, uh, you know, you're going to break him down and get him out of there eventually. Which is smart, because that's the exact way, you know, Lennox Lewis was so effective for years. You know, he didn't try to put on the big show. He would just break his man down. And, you know, they can't cope with your power forever when you throw that sharp of punches the way that uh, a guy like Lewis or even Joshua now does. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because Joshua, as you can imagine, is the, uh, the sort of fan favourite in the UK. And uh, for the first time in his career, he took some stick off to that Dominic Brazil fight. A lot of the, the, the hardcore Joshua fans were um, a bit negative that it took him seven rounds to get rid of someone who looked as limited as Brazil. But funnily enough, I, I actually took the opposite opinion. I uh, I thought it was one of his best performances today. I thought he showed a, 
uh, a brain in there and I thought he, he systematically beat down his opponent, which I really like to see. Yeah, uh, like it, uh, that's what tactical heavyweight boxing is all about. It's breaking your man down and then, you know, getting him out of there. And then if you can't get him out of there, if you break him down, you're going to win the rounds either way. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's, it's a smart way to go about things. Like speaking of that situation of uh, Eric Molina, who we discussed earlier, mm -hmm. when he fought Areola that time, he actually had Areola badly hurt in the first round and almost had him out of there and tried to press. He couldn't get him out of there, and then he himself got knocked out at the end of the round because he was gassed. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't have much boxing experience myself, but I know you have to pace yourself because you're expending a lot of energy in there. Absolutely. And I think if he can develop that patience in his game and, and limit the risks, um, it's going to be in his benefit in the long run, especially as he steps up in class. Yeah, I was impressed, actually, by that Brazil outing because, uh, I mean, what, what could you say he did wrong? He didn't take tremendous punishment. He landed his shots. You know, he was winning every round. Absolutely. And he got him out. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the, the, the sort of fans over here like to see him running through opponents in, in one or two rounds and they, they like the idea that, you know, if Anthony Joshua hits you, you're gone. And I mean that Dominic Brazil fight disappointed a few pe few uh, a few people for that reason. But, you know, I think the guys who know about boxing and have been following it for, for some time know that, you know, every heavyweight meets a, a point in their career where power isn't enough and they need to show more. And I think on that night he actually did show a bit more. So I give him I give him respect for that. Yeah, no, I look forward to seeing his uh, career as it rises. I don't think uh, there's too many guys out there that are giving him a hard time. Absolutely. But the, uh, the good uh, note is is that uh, Joseph Parker is now the mandatory for his IBF, mm. and the IBF is very strict with their mandatories. So basically all that means is that and you'll have one easier defense now, and then after that we're going to see a real fight against Parker. And uh, if that's not the case, then I could, the only way I could see him getting out of that and vacating is if he went for another unification fight. Yeah, I think that Parker fight is a big fight, you know. Uh, hey, I'll... you know what? That might be one of the very rare situations where, I mean, arguably we could have the two best fighters at heavyweight in the world going against each other, which, as we know in modern boxing, I mean, arguably, but uh, as we know in modern boxing, that's a very rare situation. <laughs> Dave, Dave, Dave. The uh, two best heavyweights in the world are actually squaring off against each other on October the 29th <laughs> in Manchester. Uh, <laughs> definitely. Yes, uh, I had heard that. I'm not so convinced that uh, Vladimir Klitschko is the, one of the two best anymore. But uh, I, uh, I yeah. guess uh, we all know that uh, who the champion is and who the challenger is. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, 